this is kind of a homecoming for me. I was one of the original, uh, at least I thought, think I was one of the original members uh, of, of the of, uh, Rogue Valley Society when it opened up. And I, I can attest to the library. There's everything you wanted back there and more. And uh, thousands of books and titles. And uh, if you have any interest in, it's not just UFOs, it's uh, everything related. Uh, reincarnation, uh, a lot of stuff from Edgar Casey, uh, lots of things back there, all kinds of things. It's about two rooms back. I've got a wonderful little thing in here. So at the break, uh, which will coming up uh, probably at nine or so, we will uh, let you go back and take a look at it. Um, I spent um, four or five years being interested in uh, UFOs in the late 50s, and I had the privilege of working with Donald Kehoe, uh, who uh, formed the NICAP organization. And uh, we uh, were able to do a significant investigation for him in uh, 1958, when uh, George Adamski came to uh, Kansas City. Um, and uh, I'll cover that in just a minute. And, uh, but about 1960, uh, I was, went to uh, become a full-time teacher. Well, I wanted to coach, and to be a good coach, you've got to go to a small town. And some of you have been through this mess. And, and uh, small towns don't have a lot of metaphysical people and a lot of people interested in UFOs. So essentially, I was a dropout from UFOs for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> now, I dropped back in in 1989. And uh, I would be glad to entertain the questions a little later or the difference I could see. There were some basic differences. Some things were the same. But about 19... Um, uh, 94, my wife and I were on vacation in New Mexico, and we had a chance to visit the Roswell site. Uh, if we wanted to stay another night in Roswell, a uh, motel and meals and so forth and so forth, and we were heading home from a trip to Virginia. And uh, the guy said, well, there is a place out called the Saint Plains of San Augustine, uh, west of here, and I have a rancher's name, we call him, and we decided to, to give that a try. So apparently there were two craft went down at Roswell, and this was the second one, the same night. And it's been endorsed by many, many people, uh, including Stanton Friedman and others. And I was able, uh, fortunate enough, to work on that uh, called the Plains of St. Augustine project. And uh, we won't be telling much, talking much about this tonight, although I will show you a couple of things that I did find there. And uh, we were on that almost 12 years. And... Uh, then I got a letter from a, an airman, uh, whose picture's right here, named Kirtland. And he said, I was at Holloman Air Force Base in 1955 when Eisenhower made a secret visit there and went aboard a UFO. I said, sure, yeah, you know, well, send me a letter, you know. Uh, let me hear, see it in writing. Well, he did, seven pages. So what you're going to see as a result of that investigation this evening, uh, and uh, the people I've managed to contact who denied it, verified it, uh, the work we have yet to do. And uh, the materials will be up here for your perusal a little later. I have the letter here from the, uh, the airman. I have his service record. Uh, he was indeed at Holloman Air Force Base from uh, early 1954 through uh, almost 1956. Uh, he completely checks out. He and five or six of his friends, uh, whom we are trying to get a hold of right now, uh, saw Ike's plane, saw Ike, heard him speak. He spoke at a base theater. He also spoke at a hangar, a supply hangar. But Ike wasn't supposed to be there. He was supposed to be somewhere else. We'll also cover that. So I think what we'll start, uh, go ahead and get started on uh, the background here. I've got a light... Uh, I got a light person around. They can handle the lights. We, we've got uh, we, we, the lights are set. We, we got to leave them on. Yeah. Oh, all right. Um, yours truly, uh, U.S. Navy, 1954. Um, I had just read a book about UFOs. I'll uh, we'll try to. Maybe I better sit over here at the corner. No people high, can see behind. And uh, Frank Scully's book came out in 52. I think I got a hold of it in 1953. And I was mildly interested in it. 
Uh, but I, I went back to my hometown of St. Joseph, Missouri, and uh, uh, from, uh, was on the USS Box, Boxer, the aircraft carrier. By the way, the Boxer is still in commission. It's a helicopter assault ship now. I think it's based somewhere in the Middle East. And uh, this is my uh, wife-to-be and myself at a junior college fun day. We had uh, uh, at the junior college where we both went. Uh, this is a well-worn uh, George Adamski book. And, uh, you know, he said a lot of fantastic things in there. Now, you've got to remember, this was before miniaturization. And I almost believe some of them, but when he said he had a, they had a radio the size of a pack of cigarettes, I said, no way. <laughs> so sometimes we can disbelieve the wrong things for the wrong reasons. Of course, now we have computers and calculators that are one eight inch thick, and we need to put ten of them in a pack of cigarettes. But uh, anyhow, uh, I was uh, uh, my interest was piqued. Uh, it, he came to uh, Kansas City in 1958 and uh, gave a talk to a UFO study club there. Uh, quite a, a interesting guy. He's had a Polish background. Uh, his dad was Adamski. Yes, George Adamski. His, da his dad was, uh, uh, was uh, Polish, his mother was Egyptian. He spent uh, two hitches in the U.S. Cavalry prior to and during World War I. Um, and he opened up a um, snack bar on the slopes of Mount Palomar. Actually, we worked at one, he didn't open it up. And uh, that's where I first met him. But I uh, didn't know him well, but uh, he said that he had uh, to go to Davenport to give a talk, and he was coming back to Kansas City. When he got back to Kansas City, he said he'd been taken to Davenport in a flying saucer. And I just started an ICAP affiliate, which is National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, and uh, I, I wrote Keyhole, or called him, I forget what, would you like to uh, be investigated? By all means. They've been trying to find out whether Adamski was really saying the truth or not. Well, it turns out that uh, the train never stopped in the train yards. Uh, and he could not have gotten in and out of a vestibule in those days in a, in a chair car without, a, without help. Couldn't have uh, closed it. They would have had to get his luggage. But he claims some guy drives up in a 58 Pontiac, and uh, black, uh, by the way, and t took him to a grove of trees where they found a UFO. And he went to Davenport and did his UFO talk. And he came back to Kansas City, handed in his, ticket, his tickets, which he could have bought two, two sets of, of course. He had a secretary with him named Lizzie McGinnis. And uh, so we investigated it and found out that there was absolutely no way that he could have gotten off of that train onto a UFO uh, in the time uh, line and the place he said he, he said he did. Well, this was the first nail in his coffin. Uh, he's still alive and kicking and a ghost nowadays, but... Uh, he was one of the first people who made contact, said he contacted people from outer space. Uh, the, the first contactee. Well, there were a lot of them followed him, tried to emulate what he had to say. Uh, but uh, in those days, um, if you were an author and you wrote a book, then you write, had to write another book, you went out and gave a bunch of talks. Well, they wouldn't invite you back unless you had something new to say. So you'd invent a little more of your story. Oh, well, I went to Venus, so he'd write another book. I'd ask you on Venus. And they, they'd, he'd be invited out for more talks. So the lecture circuit uh, has sort of a built-in um, if a person wants to phone you something up, it's a good place to do it because you're getting paid for it. Somebody's paying your way somewhere. Anyhow, he uh, ended, eventually ended up uh, going to London and uh, tried to see the king and queen and then this whole thing in Kansas City was presented to him at a news conference. He tried to grab the papers, made a real fool of himself. Anyhow, that's my contact with George Adamski. Um, the site that we found on the plane to San Augustine, 1994, this is an aerial view of it. You see the oh, sagebrush has been sliced off uh, at the one end there. And... Uh, there's a little sagebrush on the right, below the dotted lines, and on the left side, of course, it's all sagebrush. Well, this is an aerial view of about 200 feet, 
And the dotted lines are actually one foot wide you, uh, highway patrol flagging tape that they use to flag uh, certain sites on the highways in the air and held down by shovels full of dirt. And uh, then the next day I went to Socorro, uh, got to a plane and we flew back and photographed it. The site is 128 feet long and uh, uh, we won't dwell on that this evening but I will tell you some of the things I found and show you some things later. But coming up here, uh, we did 28 of these holes in 19, uh, 2004 and 2006. We had a crew of eight Navajos. They did uh, 28 of these excavations in that same area you saw from the air, and we found a lot of material. Most of it is foil, unknown foil with a high silicone content. Doesn't match any foil that we know of. And it went in there, apparently, uh, and was covered over. We think there was a trench, and the Army came in and filled it in. And in so doing, they filled, covered a lot of the material over. This is very soft, lo uh, loam, uh, sandy loam soil. And so uh, this was one of the things that we found. And uh, we sent it to Denton Cooley, who invited the first human heart. And uh, hmm? artificial, yes, artificial heart, yes. And uh, he said it had four chambers, as far as he could tell. He thought it had been a pump. It might have been a heart. But he said, this is material we don't know anything how to use. It's common material. It's high-density polyethylene. Hold your water bottle over you. This is low density polyethylene. High density is what you have in Tupperware. Sicker material. And uh, he said, I wish I'd known how to fabricate this when we were making our heart. We did manage to take some pictures of it in the Smithsonian. And it's a, he, his heart was Dacron and nylon, and it kept a man alive, I think, 65 hours. And of course, since then, we've actually had actual heart transplants. Um, then we found, uh, I was, did a book, and that was on the front of it. And we also have a little shoe, which, uh, I find my laser printer here. Okay, is this the laser? Um, third button down, okay. There it is. There's a little shoe sole right here. Uh, it did not match any known foot. And there are 300 sizes on Earth. 300 shoe sizes, shoe possibilities. It was too long and too narrow to match any known foot. I have it with me. I'll show it to you uh, after uh, the break. Uh, we, uh, Cooley also suggested that we have a CAT scan done. And when we go afford it, we eventually did. And that artifact material, which I showed you earlier, this is a, a slice from the center of it showing various chambers. It had been collapsed, which made it a little hard to figure out how it worked but apparently it was some kind of an artificial uh, organ that held fluid and dispensed it. Whether it was a heart or not, I don't know. Uh, we found this in 1996, mm -hmm. when we worked at Plains of San Augustine site. I haven't been back there for several years. Uh, inside the, uh, one of the chambers, we were able to get in there with a pair of tweezers and pulled out a piece of starch. A piece of starch the size of a pinhead. This is what was on the pinhead. Now, the red hair I got from a girl standing next to me at the microscope, but the gold wire is what was on the pinhead. This is a gold wire with a component in the center. And Cooley said he thought it might have been a, some kind of, a, of a, uh, uh, a monitoring device that went through the system of the body whatever body it was in. The girl standing next to me in a microscope, this was done right up here at Sock, I said, can I borrow one of your red hairs? She said, are you going to pay me back? Uh, I, well, I didn't, but anyhow, we laid it down, photographed it, and that's a human hair, 70 microns wide. We figure that the gold wire is about 10 microns wide, and the component in the center is about maybe 30 or 40 microns wide. That's one of the things that was inside this artifact that we were talking about. Well. Uh, back, to, meanwhile, back to Earth. Uh, Air, Airman uh, Wilbur uh, Kirtland sent me the, the letter, which is available up there for you if you want to read it later on, and told me about Eisenhower's visit. <coughs> excuse me, to Holloman, 1955. Well, we first had to find out if Airman Kirtland was there. He was, very definitely there. 
We find his uh, performance reports, even uh, a part where he got chewed out for letting some uh, eggs die in a laboratory. I even have a picture of the doctor that uh, wrote the report right here. Anyhow, essentially, uh, he said that uh, he was called out of the barracks. He knew Ike was there that day, but they had a, a policy at the air base. No one is to gawk at the president. Business as usual. So they really took it seriously. There was actually a UFO earlier seen on the um, hovering over the tarmac, and they wouldn't let him go out and look at it. Well, his friend had just come in and said, "You want to see this thing out here? This thing out, this silver thing out here over the over the over the tarmac, over the uh, the uh, flight line." He asked if he could go out and said no. So anyhow, this is an uh, artist rendition of Eisenhower's Air Force uh, Combine Three leaving Holman Air Force Base about 4.30 in the afternoon of uh, February, uh, I believe, uh, 12th, 1955. He did see the plane leave. All day long, people came in. He was uh, an orderly at a hospital. And uh, did you see this? Did you see that? Ike was talked down at the hangar, the supply hangar. They had him over at the base theater. This guy was just itching to get out to see Ike. He didn't manage to see his plane leave. Now, this is a, a Lockheed uh, 129E, and it has a black nose, I'll show you later. I think I got a picture of it. It has a radar in there for weather purposes. There was only two of these. Nixon had the other one in South America. So it had, it, this was uh, no doubt, undoubtedly I explained. Uh, here's a uh, material from uh, uh, his file showing me the Holloman Air Force Base down at the, uh, here, says it has a secret clearance, and this in here is the uh, material showing he was there. I have a whole sheath of papers proving this man was at Holloman Air Force Base. I worked hard at it, and he was there. Uh, Eisenhower decided <coughs> early February 1955 to go hunting. Uh, and uh, you may think that's a strange place to go once you see what we've been talking about here in a minute. But he went to uh, a plantation in Georgia. He'd been there the year before. His secretary of the treasurer, Humphrey, he signed your money in those days, you guys who were alive, is on, on the right, Ike in the middle, of course, the dog handler on the left. <coughs> you know, a cup of water, excuse me. Eisenhower went down here every February during uh, bird season uh, from 1954 to 50. Nine, I believe. And this was the year before when they'd gone out and gotten their limit. Uh, the next year, uh, the weather turned really bad. So this was 1954 from uh, this, uh, Thomasville, Georgia. Chamber of Commerce sent me the photograph. Now, this is uh, the crew on Ike's plane. There are 14 of them that, uh, that took any, any one trip. Uh, on the end, you see four guards. So that means that there was about 10 on the crew. Four guards on the end. The people I've been dealing with uh, are, are one of the guards is still alive who told me quite a bit of information. <coughs> Excuse me again. Uh, thank you for the water. Uh, this is the Columbine 3, Lockheed 123L, and it had been lengthened by about 18 feet, and it had a triple tail. Uh, they call it vertical elevator in the Air Force. But these were, uh, th this was the crew that normally went. The four guards on the end, uh, there were eight guards actually. And they alternated trips if it was a domestic trip. If they were going overseas, they took all eight. If they were in, in the United States, they'd take four. Now, they weren't personal guards. They were guards for the plane, the airplane. It was under constant guard. And these guys are well armed, I discovered later. But the uh, far end is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Draper. Uh, next to him is uh, the, s the first pilot they called Thompson, then a fellow named Pugolosi, and a navigator. And then the enlisted men start in uh, uh, right about underneath the, uh, about the fifth one over. There were two stewards, uh, four guards, uh, a mechanic uh, that knew about the engines. And on this particular trip to Thomasville, there was a guy from Lockheed also on the uh, passenger manifest. 
This is uh, the Columbine three in South America. They'd had some uh, trouble there, and they uh, had uh, not only did they have the eight guards with them, they had uh, uh, eight or ten marine uh, uh, guards from the embassy there, also around the plane. They completely rigged the plane. So it was a formidable. Uh, try to get to that plane would have been very difficult unless you had a pass. <coughs> uh, Master Sergeant Leo Borrego. Uh, he has a Romanian uh, background. His folks came in uh, the Depression era to uh, the United States. Uh, he had been a lieutenant in uh, the Philippines uh, and was involved in, with, I believe, in the 35th Divi Division in the, in, the, uh, in the invasion of Luzon. Uh, that was about the time uh, the next island after MacArthur went back and, uh, and returned to Leyte. Uh, after the war, he wanted to stay in, so they had a program called Stripes for Bars. So they gave him a master sergeant rank, and he turned his lieutenant bars in. And he also was a guard on Roosevelt's plane, Truman's plane, Eisenhower's plane. He lived until about 1994. <coughs> but a lot of our information comes directly through him. He's standing in front of the Independence, which is President uh, Truman's plane. Uh, this, my guess is this would be 53 or 54, somewhere in that area. You see him there again, they're right under the gangway. Uh, anybody recognize the gal in the middle under the star? Come on, some intensified it. Well, uh, at the same time, uh, the gentleman here uh, named uh, uh, Gorb uh, Gromico, I guess it was, was replaced by Marshal Bogannon. Now, the real power over here is Khrushchev. But it, in 1955, early, first week of 1955, uh, this, gem, this, this fellow was forced to turn his resignation to the party, and Bogannon took over. And so the Russians were in a state of flux. And they were kind of up in the air. And so, so these are some of the headlines we saw in the uh, uh, papers. Mass and blah, the unending revolution, and, and it goes on and on and on. And this is Stalin laying here in his coffin, his beer, as they call it, in 1953. And his heir successor didn't make it. That's 55. He was replaced by this gentleman, and then we know about Khrushchev coming in a little later. So this was a sign that was done in both Chinese and English about uh, the U.S. supporting the Quimoy, uh uh, Matsu uh, shelling. We eventually talked the Chinese into withdrawing off of the islands uh, back to Formosa. And then got really tough. Uh, Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles made very tough statements. The whole world was upset about them. Here you'll see in a minute why. Uh, the U.S. has new and powerful weapons of, this, uh, of precision, Dulles. We're talking nuclear here. Eisenhower said, in any combat where nuclear weapons are used, they can be used on strictly military targets. Now, this was big talk uh, in 1955. Then, uh, as the Komori Matsu crisis unfolded, Ike asked Congress to grant him authority to act. Congress provided it. Guess who railroaded this authority to the Formosa Resolution through uh, the Senate and the Congress, Lyndon Baines Johnson. He tried it again in the Gulf of Tonkin and didn't pull it off, which got us deeper into the Vietnam War. In the meantime, back at uh, Thomasville, Georgia, Ike was supposed to be in this peaceful little cottage, uh, which was part of, a, of a, um, the plantation where he was hunting. And uh, you did not, the press didn't go in there and out, in and out of the uh, plantation grounds. They were off limits. So he literally had uh, as much space as he wanted to move around in. If he wanted to leave, no one would even know it. They assumed he was here because his press secretary said, Ike is here. He won't be playing golf or go to church, but he's got the sniffles. And he also, uh, I don't know they, how long the sniffles lasted, but uh, whether he had them when he got to Holloman that night or not, I don't know. 
And then over here, we have where the newsmen are being treated by, to a party by Mr. Humphrey. That'll keep him busy for one evening and hangovers the next morning. So, uh, and this is his uh, press secretary, uh, Hagerty. And that's what they said, why they weren't going to see Ike for several days. I figured he was gone, according to the newspapers, 36 hours. It only takes five hours to fly to Holloman and five hours to return. So, however, uh, some people saw him in Holloman. Uh, now, this is an electrician. His uh, wife, his uh, daughter doesn't want me to use his name right yet. She's still using it. She got a divorce. <coughs> and uh, he uh, had this family story that she sent me. And uh, he was on a pole. Uh, uh, by the way, got to slide in backwards. I knew it. This is uh, his Signal Corps, the first page of his Signal Corps uh, book. He was uh, at Camp Gordon, Georgia. And this is some of the, uh, the, the, the activities he had in the Signal Corps. So uh, they saw Ike's plane land about a, uh, 8.30 in the morning. And, uh, but it went between some buildings. They, couldn't, they weren't standing on the uh, edge of the runway. They were business as usual, back uh, doing some uh, electrical work. And one of the guys said, why don't you climb that pole see if you can see where he is? Well, there was nothing wrong with climbing a pole. There were electricians. They had the gear with them. So he had a truck with him and two or three guys. And uh, he got up there about halfway, uh, he said about 35 feet in the air. And the truck drove off. And men were shouting, come down. And they all started running in the opposite direction. So he swung around on the pole. And there's a the UFO 150 feet from him. Now, apparently, there were two of them. One of them was, uh, according to Kirtland and his friends, landed in front of Air Force One, and the other one was over the flight line, which I think was probably cover for uh, just kind of flying cover. But uh, he said, I swung around and I saw this pie tin-like thing. You've got to remember that in 1955, we had no pictures of UFOs except for Damsky's book and some others. And there were Model Ts compared to this thing. Um, uh, and people didn't know what they looked like. Uh, that's a composite. Yeah, it's not a photograph. Thank you. Guys, <laughs> we worked on it, and um, people did not know what they looked like. I didn't see a UFO until '56 or '7 when I saw the movie called UFO, and there were two lights going behind the water tower. Anybody remember that? In that, in that uh, thing. Well, this thing uh, just scared the heck out of them. He said he came down so fast, he didn't hit the spikes more than once or twice in the 40 feet. And you've seen them do it at lumber carnivals, timber carnivals. And they don't, didn't have sponge rubber to jump down on. As a matter of fact, he kid, his family kidded him about it because the men back at the shop said that was the day Dad became a fireman. He came down that pole so fast, uh, he became a fireman. Is this supposed to be a faithful rendering of, uh, of, yes. of, of what they witnessed? Right. Yeah, it's a rendering of what, uh, what he said he witnessed. Uh, what was going on at uh, Holloman Air Force Base in those days? Well, there's a Dr. David Simon. He was a supervisor of the Airman Kirtland for a while. He uh, had to, uh, Kirtland let the eggs die in the uh, incubator. But in any case, uh, he is shown here in 1956, 57, uh, having taken a balloon to 100,000 feet. And this is on the uh, cover of Life magazine. These, now, we're dealing with people here are famous national heroes. And I'm telling you, it's difficult to get these people to come out. I, I had to have someone contact him who knew him and ask him about Ike's visit. I'll tell you about what he said a little later. Another guy was Joseph Kittinger. Kittinger did a 102,000-foot parachute drop, which is still a record. Kittinger is now uh, in, uh, I believe, Boca Raton, Florida. This is him uh, jumping out of his uh, gondola at 102,000 feet. World famous. Both these guys were there in February of 1955 because of, of their exploits. Are, are, we, we know where they are, where they were. Okay. Uh, well, I got going down the list. Arthur Godfrey. Who's Arthur Godfrey? Yeah. Uh, entertainer. What do you have? Uh, 
Friday show? Yeah. Arthur Godfrey? Well, he wasn't in the social list of people uh, at that Arthur Godfrey. And boy, I did this research on that one. And I finally ran onto a website called Conrad, and it talked about what Arthur Godfrey was doing. Arthur Godfrey, seen here on a page of Life magazine, 1955, had been uh, asked by the government, as well as Edward R. Murrow, remember Edward R. Murrow, the famous uh, reporter, this is London, World War II guy, to make an announcement that the c country was still functioning and the government was doing well after that we'd been attacked by nuclear bombs. Arthur Godfrey was on Eisenhower's plane. That's off the manifest. Now, all of a sudden, UFOs took a backseat. Because I'm thinking here about UFOs, and now all of a sudden we're talking about nuclear war. Arthur Godfrey on Air Force One. How close were we to nuclear war in 1955? Or how close did we think we were? We had no, no idea, my wife and I in St. Joe Mo. Uh, we had an oatmeal plant, uh, a Quaker oat plant, and two packing houses, and that wasn't ground zero as far as we knew. But uh, uh, Arthur Godfrey on Air Force One going to Thomasville, Georgia, that got my attention. But by the way, he didn't go back with them. He went back on his own somehow. So anyhow, back here. So uh, we ran on to a Time Magazine article called The Doomsday Plan. And this is where Arthur Godfrey and Edward R. Murrow were to make an announcement to the people that the, um, everything's okay, Washington's been wiped off, face the map, don't worry, you're all in your shelters, listen to our broadcast, and so forth and so on. And they were sort of making public service announcements after we've been attacked by nuclear bombs. All of a sudden, the UFOs took a back seat. Uh, the first bomb of Soviet, 1949. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we uh, de detonated our uh, hydrogen bomb in 52, but didn't announce it till 54. Anyhow, so uh, I have the this, the website's called Kungarad, and they have this material on there, and I was able to get a hold of the Time magazine and get the article before our library closed. And uh, this is, uh, talks about that. So we had two well-known people who were going to um, make public service announcements if we've been attacked by nuclear bombs. One of them was on Eisenhower's Air Force One. Oh. And that's a nuclear bomb if you uh, uh, can't see it, it's too dark. So we got a whole series, uh, went to a all of the different places I could find. And in 1955, this might have been the supplement for your newspaper. Instead of the parade and other stuff, here's the emergency plan for a nuclear war. What to take to a shelter on the left here. Uh, have a radio in the shelter with you. Get under your house in a crawl space. They were trying to, apparently the fallout only lasted two weeks if you only had one bomb. So they wanted people to be uh, uh, inside under some uh, several floors, several layers, and apparently the crawl space here would have been appropriate uh, for uh, somebody in a home. Here's a list of things you take with you. Here's Mr. and Mrs. America uh, in their shelter listening to the radio. Now, since I lived through this whole thing, I think I'm entitled to be, uh, to t be a little spoofy about it. And um, uh, the various things here that shows you what you should do. I'll leave it up here in case you want to see it. Where you should be, what you should take with you, so forth and so on. Um, um, scene here. <laughs> so I kind of envisioned uh, Mrs. Homemaker in her miniskirt uh, in, under the house. Uh, doing her dishes or whatever and so forth and so on. And this is where they suggested that we all be, under the house. Because if you had a three-story house, it means you had three floors that would shield radiation from you. Uh, two would be enough, but three would be fine. So where was the government? Well, the government was in 
big facilities back east. One of them is called Greenbrier. You've probably seen it on TV over the years. Here's a 14-inch thick door leading into this opulent facility. This is where your congressmen and senators were staying. And uh, Supreme Court, while you run the house. So everybody was well taken care of, sounds like to me. You run your house, crawling around, and they were uh, uh, in a very opulent, uh, high, uh, uh, high facility. There was one of these for the Congress, one for the Senate, one for the Supreme Court. And I understand we spent billions of dollars, and we didn't know much about it at the time, but 97 of these things, most of them around the East Coast. Facilities. Uh, and then, uh, so I got a little spoofy here. And uh, I said, uh, okay, Edward R. Morrow, this was Washington. The uh, White House is gone, the Capitol is in ruins, but the IRS building still stands. <coughs> okay. Hello, friends, Arthur Godfrey here. Boy, have I got a product for you. So uh, we've got some really interesting stuff going on under this house, haven't we? Uh, feeling depressed? Well, who wouldn't be with the Washington wiped off the face of the map? Lonely, isolated, under your own house? Who wouldn't be isolated? Out of control? Who wouldn't feel out of control? So uh, Arthur Godfrey was a super pitch man. Now, that wasn't his only job. He got on and had his Arthur Godfrey and his friends and musicians and uh, he was, they played a little ukulele himself, and he was one of the early TV pioneers. But he could sell uh, a fur coat uh, in the South Sea Islands to somebody. So, uh, now we have things changed. We've been under the house quite a while now, and uh, whatever Arthur Godfrey was pushing, uh, apparently it wasn't birth control pills, because they've had a baby now. Uh, Dad is still looking a little disheveled. Mom's not quite as sharp as she was before. They've got a bottle two here or whatever it is. And now for the good news. After the devastating nuclear attack, your government continues to function. Wouldn't that be great to hear in, in your little crawl space? <coughs> so, uh, 1953, Nagasaki, Japan. I had the privilege, uh, honor, or you might want to say uh, almost a duty to visit the site of the second uh, atomic bomb blast. This is a Catholic church which was a half mile from ground zero at Nagasaki. And uh, we were photographing some of the ruins of the Catholic church. This was looking through the main doorway into the sanctuary area. And uh, most of the, the wooden frame buildings have been re replaced by 1953 when I was there, but the, the, the um, uh, other things were probably the um, uh, more permanent buildings hadn't been built yet. Uh, this was a little orphan. Uh, there was an orphanage next door to the Catholic Church and uh, a little Japanese orphan. And this is a map showing the bomb blast and so forth, uh, where it had blasted and what it uh, had done. Essentially, this, this sign says 76,000 people were vaporized here. Now, later on, more uh, people died uh, from radiation and so forth. But at this point, when this sign was put up in about 1952, uh, it had only been 76,000 died here. Uh, Arthur Godfrey, huh? Well... Now, uh, Kellerman kept ringing a bell. Who's Kellerman? Kellerman, Kellerman, Kellerman. Anybody remember a man named Kellerman connected with the president? How about the motorcade in Dallas? Front seat in front of JFK, Agent Roy Kellerman. He was on that plane that went uh, to Thomasville, Georgia also. Agent Roy Kellerman. Well, this gets interesting. Uh, all of a sudden, now we have a nuclear war, now we're talking about presidential assassination. And um, uh, Kellerman is a gentleman standing in front of uh, Sergeant Brago. Right there. He joined the Secret Service in 1943, I think. Of course, we remember this scene. All of us, we've been in, in, 
and indelible in our minds. And of course, uh, towards the end of the uh, uh, beginning of the administration, we had a little Camelot. Jackie here is pregnant with John John. Remember John John's salute to his dad at the funeral? Uh, Kittinger, top man here. He's the one who did the parachute job. He said uh, he did not recall Eisenhower being at Holloman in 1955. It must have been after he left in 58. Uh, according to information we have, Kittinger and his boss, Colonel Sharp, had lunch with Eisenhower at, at Holloman. Dr. Simons, the gentleman who did the uh, balloon drop, won't answer the question. We've been asked by uh, somebody who we asked to ask him to ask him, and he will not answer the question in an email. He won't refer to it at all. Uh, Kittinger, still, uh, still flying high. Here he is in a private plane, age 79. Now, these are two very famous people. We were just even lucky to get a hold of them, let alone uh, get answers from them. And here's uh, Dr. Simon holding hands with a with woman, not his wife, age 98. Now, there is a, a, a story of here. It's a cohort of his who helped found the clinic, and they had this picture taken at an anniversary dinner. I think his wife's still alive, but th this is his picture here, and life of 1957. Borrego, uh, no longer with us, served Roosevelt, Truman, and Eisenhower. Master Sergeant Board, still alive in Eugene. And uh, now the electrician, uh, he passed away in, the, in 1989, had a stroke about 86, uh, had to retire and passed away. His daughter told me about 1989. Uh, the gentleman who tried to talk his girlfriend into going on the roller coaster married her. Raise your hand, Mary Lou. Forty-nine and a half years. <coughs> Airman uh, Kirkland, retired uh, aerospace engineer uh, in computers, worked with Lockheed, same one that made the president's plane. Uh, also worked on defense contracts for NASA. Yeah, I know. Um, well, we see UFOs all over the place uh, now. And this one happens to be about uh, 400, uh, 600 years ago. And I'll give you an uh, enlargement here. In the background is an illuminated object behind the Virgin Mary. In the background is an illuminated object behind the Virgin Mary. And we'll get to see it a little bit better here in just a minute. Now, the only thing they had 600 years ago, in 1429, I think it was, was, can was uh, fire and candles. You're not going to illuminate a UFO with fire and candles. This is in, actually in the painting uh, it, it found in Italy a few years ago. So anyhow, uh, here's what they're seeing in the background. Right here is the, the guy looking up at the UFO, which is here. Here it is right here. And I've put a spoofy title in here. Don't bother little Geo and Jesus. We must not concern ourselves with weather balloons. We have much work to do. So uh, Virgin Mary gives a pretty good advice 600 years ago. Uh, we never did find out who little Geo was. He, he, he wasn't even listed in the Catholic book of saints. <laughs> but somebody thought he was important. Uh, speaking of weather balloons, the caption on this, uh, what we did, uh, up in the corner here is General Ramey. The caption says, Okay, General, where did you get this crap? This isn't what we brought down from Roswell. <coughs> Ike uh, was a man of, uh, of these times. Here you see the, the styles and the dress. He's addressing some women's and men's clubs back, uh, back east. He, uh, I got a new respect for the man. He us through some pretty tough times, and I don't think many of us realize how tough they might have been. And uh, he was a great, a great president. Uh, here's what might have happened at Holloman Air Force Base. This is what they say happened. Air Force One confronted with a UFO. Sounds unbelievable, but somebody in our government is contacted about that time. 
We're very sure of that. Uh, and we've been uh, dealing with them for some time. Uh, however, I don't think it was uh, any earlier than 55. It might have been 54. We're not sure. A, wonder, a great guy and married a great gal. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we're up to getting close to a, a break. And um, I have, um, is that right, the break time? Okay, about a 10-minute break. Uh, don't forget the library in back. Uh, lots of material here on the table. And uh, here's some of the material that we found at the first site. I'd ask you not to handle it, but I'll lay it on the table for you to look at. Here's the shoe and the um, artificial uh, whatever it was. Oh, we still have uh, about eight people that we know of who were at Holloman. Uh, we know where five of them live. We haven't contacted them yet. Um, uh, we're in the process of contacting them. Apparently, most of the officers are going to go with the line. We didn't, don't know anything. And most of the enlisted men are going to go with the line. We've seen it. So uh, there's a lot more coming uh, with this uh, project. We're, we've been on it about a year and a half. We got Kirtland's letter about a, about a year and a half ago. I met with him at the Eisenhower Museum last June, June 8th. This uh, Airman Kirtland. He's a very, very credible person. Now, Kirtland's not his real name. He doesn't want me to use it, but uh, everything checks out. Uh, and uh, even the fact that he got a reprimand from uh, Dr. Simon here. This is Dr. Simon. Here he is at 98, and here's a reprimand signed by Simon. <laughs> Says, you don't have an app tube with this kind of work. What he did was let some eggs die in a laboratory. Didn't, didn't put water in the, in the incubator or something. Now, if man's ready to bear all, including 50-year-old mistakes, he's going to have some credibility in my, in my, 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 uh, my estimation. So we're just kind of getting into this project. Uh, and it's not over by any means. OK, questions? They thought he was at Thomasville hunting. And uh, he was out of the sight of the press for 36 hours. And um, that they said he was sitting by the fire, drinking hot toddies and playing Scrabble in the middle of a world crisis. <laughs> I don't buy it. I didn't buy it very well. And uh, things were really upset in that world. And, England was involved, in, uh, and uh, Churchill was going to talk to the Russian leaders about uh, what Eisenhower and, and Dulles had said. And uh, some of you don't remember how uh, much money and time and effort we poured into helping the nationalist Chinese. But uh, we had a commitment to uh, help defend them. By the way, uh, Kamoi and Matsu are still, the two islands are still occupied by the nationalist Chinese, and they still have Formosa, called Taiwan now. I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Was there ever a chance of ever a gospel or a case in which Mr. Eisenhower had actually seen something? Oh, uh, um, the report that uh, Kirtland sent, he was uh, involved in a discussion between a man who was at the tower, uh, of Holloman Air Force Base Tower. And, uh, and, and they were in the middle, could see what was going on. And they said the president left, who they presumed to be the president, it's a quarter mile away now, you understand. The, the aircraft parked way out on a far runway. And um, uh, you could hardly see out there. And I suppose it for security reasons. And the man who presumed to be Ike came out of the, of the, of the uh, airplane, walked over to the UFO that had just landed, and uh, some kind of a ladder came down and he went inside. Now, that was uh, what they said they saw. But I have not found a witness who said they saw that. That'd be hard to do because the, uh, you're looking at a quarter mile away across an airport, heat waves, things, and it's very difficult to see. But I think he was at, at, at Holloman. What he, if what they had to do, what he did with the UFO or not, I don't know. But he was there, yes. If we could get the questions on the microphone, if you could come up to the microphone and ask a question, yeah, I'd yeah. appreciate it. 
We, we just need to get on the recording if we could. Thanks. And kind of short leash. Yeah, please uh, <laughs> use the mic. Thanks. Um, you had mentioned uh, Stanton Freeman earlier. Uh, have you brought any of your uh, information to his attention? Uh, he has, you know, people that can get some kind of clearance and go into the archives and check certain information. Uh, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, on the back of my business card, uh, for my planes project, uh, Stanton was kind enough to write this. Uh, Art Campbell has done an incredible job of, in, uh, of researching uh, the, the recovery of a 1947 crash UFO saucer on the plane to San Augustine in the Roswell timeline. He's about 100% behind me, uh, uh, and uh, he is very interested in this project. Although he does not tend to get involved with other people's things, he, uh, but he'll get, uh, he'll, he supports you, and uh, we've been to several conferences together. And uh, I'm very grateful to have his support. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? There we go. I wish we had a longer record for this. Isn't it? <laughs> um, the um, I think this uh, project kind of got to me when I realized I'd lived through this. Now. Uh, like I say, packing plants in a Quaker Oats plant is not any, anything you had to worry about in an atomic attack. But they had taken care of us, had gone through all this trouble uh, to make sure the people in those days uh, were taken care of. And I was moved by this. I really was. And um, the UFOs took a back seat when I realized we were talking about nuclear war here. And we might have been close to one. I don't know if you compare it with the 1960 Cuba the crisis in Cuba, but in 55 they thought they were close. I think that's why Godfrey was on the plane. I, I'm sure he was. And the, uh, Bob Board, the Air Force One crewman, said he'd seen him on there before. And you got to remember, Board only went on every other trip. He didn't go on every trip. They didn't take all eight guards on every trip. So, yeah. so it's quite a, a, a quite an interesting project, and it's still it's still uh, emerging, it's still developing. Well, th there's been speculation that it took the, uh, the 1945 atomic bomb that we set off. That so went off in, uh, let's see, 45 and uh, all three of them 45, weren't they? Uh, and uh, that they came just as a result of that to our planet uh, because of the light travel and so forth and so forth. I don't know about that, but I would imagine that uh, a, top, a nuclear power was on the agenda. How high it was, I have, would not have any idea. My understanding of uh, the American government has several recovered UFOs or alien spacecrafts. And uh, even uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover had written and wanted uh, possession of a disk for a cursory. Uh, I've seen that uh, material. The question is that, that we have a recovered uh, spacecraft. A, a man that I give some credibility to is Robert Lazar. And he was the one that was at Area 51, said he saw nine of them there. One of them with a hole through it, and um, so um, uh, I, I would imagine that uh, we have uh, they have shells of this kind of stuff somewhere uh, of this material that uh, we, we happen to find. Uh, this had eroded out. As a matter of fact, that the, the uh, sandy sandy soil had eroded most of this material out, and I found this on the surface, uh, half buried, and this was on the surface under a piece of sagebrush. So, um, uh, yes, I think we probably have, and I think we've been in contact with them. And the ones we shoot down are ones that we are, uh, un they're unfriendly for some reason or other. Apparently there's some friendly and some not. And uh, I think they're the ones that are getting the, uh, shot, the shot. Russians shoot down more of them than we even attempt to shoot them down. Well, I don't know. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, I, I imagine uh, 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 airspace is sacred no matter where it is. There's a, if you get on the internet, you can look up UFOs and, uh, and, uh, and missiles or nuclear energy, and you'll find pages and pages of flyovers over nuclear sites. Pages and pages of flyovers of nuclear sites. They're, uh, they're interested, and they've even apparently shut off the power sometimes for uh, some of the 
uh, in some of these silos. So the technology here is well in advance to ours. Yeah. Yes, sir. My question is, do I um, think the aliens will make them known, self known anytime soon? No, I don't think so. I think we already know about them. Those that can comprehend it know about it. Those that can't comprehend it uh, won't be able to comprehend it if they, if they showed up their front door. So uh, when I first started talking UFOs in the 50s, I did some uh, service club work in the Kansas City area. I'd say 2% of the people even believed they existed. Now we've got 65 or 70% of the people who believe they are not only exist, but they're interplanetary. Another generation, we're all going to believe it. Uh, I think they have made themselves known, uh, and I think the flyover at Phoenix is a good example. Uh, in, uh, Ten years ago, when this huge craft flew over. I think they're trying to intimidate our government by, by making slow flyovers. And they did that in the Hudson Valley a few years back. And these huge craft that are bigger than football fields I've been flying over our country, uh, and apparently we, uh, w we're forced to ignore it because we don't have the technology to, con to counteract it. But I think that's how they're making themselves known. It's flying over our cities in huge craft. Uh, yes? Are you familiar with the O'Hare sightings? Uh, only what I've been able to get off the Internet and uh, what I got on the... On the uh, 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 seen on the uh, the TV and so forth. Uh, apparently, it was uh, quite uh, dramatic. Apparently, a uh, large uh, craft. Uh, it wasn't so large as it was obvious and uh, seen by several people, including I guess pilots and uh, management. And uh, uh, it was in the Chicago Tribune. This occurred, I guess, uh, in November of last year, and then was publicized in book by that type around. Uh -huh. Uh, no, I, I think that's how the, we're going to find out about them is that such things like that. Because after a while, everybody says, well, it can't all be weather balloons, you know, uh, or uh, anomalies or swamp gas. We're not that dumb anymore. Yeah, back here. Yes, sir. Right. And, uh, so, which could be uh, time travelers, interdimensional, uh, interstellar, whatever. That's uh, certainly a possibility. Uh, that, that the, uh, the Midwest airship, uh, by the way, was over Kansas City in 1897. Yeah. I read some reports of it. Right, yes, uh, yeah. Rather than just, uh, th he was asked to tone it down by your people who were handling it. Well, um, uh, in, in regard to the military industrial complex, he made several other statements. I have some in my records. In that speech specifically, he was going to say military industrial aggression. That's exactly what he was going to say. Well, uh, well, we know why, what it came out. And, uh, right. And, and uh, I, I think. Part of the military industrial complex is no doubt involved in keeping this secret. Uh, and uh, I think the, uh, the aliens, if you want to call them that, are trying to make their own disclosure. Uh, apparently, we fear uh, open disclosure more than anything else. They're using it kind of against us. I think they think it's the time uh, our people knew they were there. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Right. Of course, it's on my little computer. It's a little image, but you can finally see some white flecks, and it's like a squadron. And um, then they show people on the street looking up and talking, but it's in Spanish. But um, my email report says that the, um, it was the head of their police or something. Huh. Well, 
well, the, yeah, you talked about the, the siding in the last few months of Peru. Uh, the, uh, what we would call underdeveloped countries uh, don't have a missile technology. And they're gonna, you're going to see more UFOs there, like Mexico City, a place like that. They're not shooting at them. And uh, so uh, even though uh, we are, we're not shooting at all of them, only some of them, apparently. So uh, apparently the underdeveloped countries, and I, one of the most interesting things I remember hearing was about uh, a, um, a sighting in South Africa at a schoolyard. Uh, John Mack went over, this is a famous Harvard psychi psychiatrist, uh, in, at, at, uh, taught psychiatry at uh, Harvard University, and he interviewed the children. He said, they've gone through a trauma. These guys know this, and they, they were able to do artwork and pictures. Now, some of the teachers were in a teacher's meeting. <laughs> Kids were out looking at a UFO, which is very interesting. But um, uh, this is how they're going to make themselves known, gradually to various people who are going to grow up with the information. And, uh, Apparently, it really threatens people in our government to have to back off and say, well, we were really wrong. We lied to you all along. You're not going to hear that. You're just going to hear stalling. Like these two guys I was telling you about, Kettinger here. Kettinger, I think, had dinner with Eisenhower and Holloman. You going to admit it? No. And uh, I have a colonel working for me at Holloman, believe it or not. He's a volunteer at the uh, Public Information Office. I said, what is it about secrecy? He said, well, in 1998, President Clinton passed a, a, a rule, a, 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 put through a rule, that anything over 20 years old was to declassified, no longer secret, unless it had a disclosure, uh, something on the front of it. So, so all of this material in 1998 was, uh, was, uh, uh, was, was no penalty for anybody uh, coming forward. I said, well, then, well, Colonel, why are they still? He said, it's patriotism. They swore they would keep the secret, and it's important that they, uh, that they are true to themselves. And he said, you're going to find a lot of people are just keeping it because of patriotism. He said, I flew uh, F-105 to Vietnam, and I saw UFOs. I was followed by them. I chased one. Everybody over there did. A, a colonel, Matson, which, uh, works at Holloman as, as a volunteer. But he said, we're divided. Half of us want to talk about it, the other half say, you can't talk about it. He said, it's just a loyalty thing now. It's no longer against the law after that, that, that uh, thing was passed. I don't have the number, but anybody can contact me, I will. So. so apparently it's loyalty that keeps half of the people in the government from admitting that this is true. I have a feeling like these people like Shermer, or some of these people you saw on Larry King Live last week, I think even uh, the uh, famous astronomer died recently. Sagan. I think they all knew they were real. But in 1952, they passed a thing called the Brookings Report, and the CIA commissioned it. And essentially, the Brookings Report said, uh, and you can look it up on the internet, that every time a, high, a, a highly sophisticated technological group of people come in contact with more primitive people, that primitive society ceases to exist. In a, in, a, in a few years. This, I think, is what they're afraid of. The churches, the, uh, the, the paternal societies, the, the financial structure. No one wants to take a chance that this stuff is going to be plowed under because uh, of, 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 uh, of a spaceship that lands somewhere. And I think this is what they're really afraid of, changing society. Changing society. You tell somebody that their religion is largely myth, they're going to get upset. Joseph Campbell said, everybody's religion is largely myth. It's just that yours is a little less myth than somebody else's. <laughs> but um, I, I, you know people who aren't ready, and I know people who aren't ready. You're ready. You wouldn't be here. Oh, you ready. Any more questions? Uh, yes, sir. One more. Right. I'll get you. Uh, I don't, uh, I can't guess, uh, second guess the motives of why they would do something or why they don't do it. Um, 
I think they were very, uh, if, if they can come down and hover over one of our silos and shut off and put all the lights to, to go and then shut them off, uh, they're going to know a lot more about us than we, than we, 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 we think we'd want them to know. So um, I think possibly we're looking here at two stratas of aliens, somebody in charge and clone type beings, the little gray people in the, in the craft. And uh, I, I, I don't know that somebody's up there with a puppeteer, you know, making, uh, uh, pulling strings. But it seems that there's two, uh, two stratas of, of, of levels of responsibility. And the most ones we see are the ones that come down and the ones that uh, the crash and so forth. Uh, there's some very, very fine books back here. I would recommend uh, The Day After Roswell by Philip Corso. Anybody read this one? The Day After Roswell by Philip Corso. He's the first insider to come out of the Pentagon and say, yes, they're real. We got, uh, I took alien technology to Bell Labs, I took to other places, and so forth and so on. I highly recommend you read this book. And it's called The Day After Roswell. He died and uh, came out about 1996 with all this data and then died um, uh, about, a, about a year later. So uh, uh, the, the Roswell incident is the best, best basic book you could have. It talks about what went on, and there's no fluff in it. Later on, they started adding to the story and moving people around. And, uh, but that basic book called The Roswell Incident by Berlitz and Moore, uh, I, would, I recommend it to all, all uh, friends that, uh, who wanted to, uh, interested in finding out about UFOs. That and Corso's book. Now, there's another author out uh, named Dolan. He's doing probably the most thorough complete, comprehensive job of UFOs, and I believe he's just published a second volume. Do we have that in the library? Uh, really a great researcher. Young man, great researcher. Uh, but you can uh, find out about pretty much what you need to know back here in the library. Yes. I can talk about 1950s. I understood there were several groups interested in talking to our government after we set off the hydrogen bomb. And um, I think possibly the one that uh, Eisenhower was meeting with one of those groups for the first time on the runway at Holloman. Um, I've heard uh, that there are as many as seven different alien groups and I've heard as many as 65 that, we, that are known. Uh, and. Uh, I don't know. We just don't know uh, uh, what they're doing, and apparently they're in contact with the government. We couldn't go on this long without this, some of them, uh, about without being in contact with some of them. Uh, what uh, I understand that uh, we're trading technology a little at a time for um, uh, information about uh, space. Anybody see this uh, item on TV while about on the internet? called the drone. This thing is flying down around Palo Alto, California. It's not a helicopter, it's something to, on magnetic waves. You get a chance after you get done, look at it, come take a look at it. This, uh, there's a company down there called Alien Technologies Unlimited. Um, down around Palo Alto, they made this and it's flying it. It's amazing. It's the first thing I've seen in the air. Now, we've got Teflon, we've got all kinds of things that that oh, came uh, miniaturization. Uh, your, your CD player is a laser. Uh, all that is technology we didn't have in '47. What's your feeling about the whole uh, alien abduction thing? If you talk to people, uh, there was a Roswell thing just recently, uh, an anniversary, and I caught part of their doing a thing on Art Bell. I'm going to get a chair here to lean on. Here Uh, I know Roger Lear, who's done most of the recovery of implants. He has medical teams. Last I heard him talk, he was uh, had 12 different things that came out of uh, human bodies. Uh, they are uh, some of them are as small as cantaloupe seeds. Some of them are as, are, as, are as big as a quarter inch in diameter. And there's one little T-shaped thing that they had trouble getting out of somebody's foot one time. And apparently they're made of a crystalline material. And uh, 
they obviously don't grow in the body. Uh, they, were, they were obviously put there. For what purpose, I don't know. Um, I think they're to keep track of some, some. There are some that are kept track of. But oh. the implants, the, the, they can be dissolved through cranial sacral work. So <laughs> they can be dissolved. That's how they're taken out. So what you're saying is that they're, they're there to keep track of people, you think? Yeah. yeah. It's like we're tagged animals. A lot of us are yeah, tagged that's, animals. Uh, one, yeah, one, a good point. That, that we tag our animals and now, and, uh, and, they, and they choose who they put implants in. Right. And they're very, they're very, you know, they have certain criteria to work with. The through generations of people that were through like several generations of families. It's kind of weird. Yeah. Uh, the 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 best book on it I can uh, re refer you to is Dr. Jacobs. Uh, he's a Temple University professor, and uh, he and John Mack both wrote on uh, alien abductions. Yes, I believe they're going on. I don't believe in many people who claim to be abducted that are abducted. But obviously they're going on for some reason or other. This may be part of the trade-off uh, that, that, that we're allowing the abdu uh, uh, abductions to, for technology. That's a speculation, but uh, I don't have any data on it. But that may be part of the trade-off. Yes, sir. Well, uh, we had those ball lightning-like uh, uh, objects called foo balls in World War II, and they were f flew alongside the German, the Japanese, the American, and British planes. We all thought they belonged to another country, but they never did any harm. So uh, my guess is those little uh, those foo balls apparently were uh, uh, were uh, controlled by uh, an extraterrestrial source who was gathering information on our, uh, our, our airplanes, but they never did any harm. They were robotic. They were robotic uh, Well, I don't know what, no one ever found one, but I think they, 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 they were probably robotic, yes. Yeah. yeah. It would have to be to be able to fly along the wingtip of a plane and then move off. Somebody has to be in control of them, yes. Okay, yes, ma'am, please speak up. At, at Holloman? Oh, um, uh, Kittinger. Yeah, Kittinger is the guy, he was a hero that did all the high altitude parachute drop. And Kittinger, uh, the, the, the base commander named Sharp at Holloman, in December of 54, two months before Eisenhower's visit there, and two months later, had been uh, the first man to travel 640 miles an hour on a sled, railroad sled that went about a half mile. And uh, they were pre-space uh, medicine going on there, so they'd know about when we got into space how much uh, acceleration or deceleration the body would take. And uh, this colonel told me, as far as he, he, could, he could dig up, that Kittinger and, and Colonel Sharp were at a luncheon with Eisenhower the day he was there. No, no. That was Kellerman. He was also on Ike's plane. Now, whether Kellerman went to Holloman, I don't know. But Kellerman was on the plane when it left Washington, D.C. And I was curious what his title or role was in 1955. Kellerman was an agent, a Secret Service agent. And then he worked himself up to supervisor by the time of the Kennedy assassination. And he was supervising the third section uh, uh, of that motorcade when uh, I when they went by the, uh, the book depository where Kennedy was shot. So he was among those 10 names at the bottom. Right, yes. I, I, and I thought, Kellerman, Kellerman, uh, you know, here we are, uh, one, one plain lot of people. We have a president and his party, the secretary of the treasury, the president. We have uh, a, a secret service agent that will be famous uh, uh, down the road. We have a guard that will come forward and talk about uh, the fact that they were uh, Eisenhower was there. Uh, we have Arthur Godfrey and a guy next to him, I think, was a speechwriter. Uh, we haven't figured out who he is yet. 
uh, I couldn't believe it. I was one to one airplane. And uh, I kept g g getting, uh, uh, jumping to one thing to another. L unbelievable experience. And it's still going on. As far as I know, I've got them sorted out of the plane. I know where they sat and, and uh, who Godfrey sat next to and so forth and so on. But uh, the fact that they was, were close to nuclear war, or at least we seem to be, this blew me, uh, blew me away. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I was just wondering about your own experience and paradigm uh, over the, these decades of research and study. Uh, is there any event that you could see that would catalyze this issue in people's minds such that, okay, we accept that, we accept that aliens exist, uh, and now what's on the next channel? Well, uh, uh, early on, uh, when I realized UFOs are real, I knew somebody had to be in them or in control of them. And so the step to uh, alien was the problem for me. Now, I said I would tell you the difference between when I was in early and when I got in later. Uh, the difference was the same stories were there, the same people were telling them, but the difference was we had these big bug-eyed aliens on all the videos. I thought, oh, no, no way, you know. Well, apparently that's, uh, that's they, they apparently those big, big uh, bulbous eyes they have are technological uh, 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 progress that they have and uh, uh, these bodies that they make, the clones or whatever you want to call them. So there's no problem for me, it was, it was, it was no jump problem, it was I knew somebody had to be in control of them and it, was, it wasn't us. So I had no problem with that. I had trouble getting, trouble with the big bug-eyed aliens for a while till I realized that would be the logical uh, sequence of events if you were trying to improve a, a, a clone or a pilot or something like that. And that was a little hard to get used to. But I thought that was all fantasy and apparently that's what they see. Those big bug-eyed aliens, some people see them. So I didn't have a problem with the jump, uh, a jump problem at all. I think the big jump is are they there or are they real? The one first jump. And I got over that about 55 or 6. And uh, the next one, there's a lot of charlatans out here trying to get your money and tell you a bunch of stuff that isn't true. That was Adamski and his train ride experience. And there's still a lot of them out there. He's talking a lot, don't have any, any evidence. I'm a pragmatic person, I need evidence. Now you can accept it or reject it, but I've got it. I've got an eyewitness. That's better than I got at Roswell. He's, the man saw the president's plane there, and that's good enough for me. Uh, all the other stuff still open to conjecture, but uh, one thing kind of follows another. But I had trouble with the bug-eyed aliens. That's one of my problems early on. Any other questions? Thank you. Yes, sir. I th in the sense that they have to, have to live and, and, and breathe or what, that they would have to be, uh, say, travel, they have to travel from vast distances away. It, with wormholes, uh, like be in some kind of life pods to, to travel great distances. Okay. Uh, if there were some kind of robotic things that were uh, controlled by uh, living aliens. Uh, Corso, who, the, who was a colonel out of the Pentagon, talked about uh, what the alien body was like. And, and if anybody take UFO magazine in here, you all, uh, occasionally will get uh, articles in there about what was the body. But he said they took a biological specimen and put artificial parts in them to make them uh, stand up to the rigors of space. This might be one of those parts. And so they took a person like yourself and put in an artificial heart, a different lung, uh, and uh, which would allow you to do some of the, 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 the maneuvers in space without uh, harming your body. This might be one of those parts. So when I read that in Corso's book, that they had taken biological entities and put artificial parts in, uh, I had a light bulb go off. And I had one. I think I had one. Because this is nothing that we know of. Uh, no, med medical people don't know about this, this thing. 
and a man who invented a human uh, artificial heart thinks it was some kind of a container that pumped. And the only thing we have in our body that pumps is a container is a heart. Well, they may not have needed a heart, but apparently they don't take nourishment. Uh, and you're dealing here with uh, apparently there's no uh, no uh, no orifice, uh, uh, nothing goes beyond the lips. Uh, so uh, obviously it's some kind of a of a of a android clone. I, I can't think of anything else, any other way of saying it. They must be there. But uh, yes. Yes. Up to their materials. Yes. What 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 you may have already mentioned, but what's known about this? This is high density polyethylene, which we use now for artificial organs. This is the whole thing is high density polyethylene. Same as uh, on a much harder. Uh, it's, uh, so is Tupperware. So is a lot of your children's toys and playgrounds. But it will stay in a body. It will not be subject to body fluids. Uh, and, uh, and I suspect uh, uh, that this may be part of one of those, uh, uh, one of those bodies. Now, uh, the reason it was on the surface of the ground was in the arroyo, the water comes down and w washes the, the topsoil away and leaves the stuff on the surface that the Air Force covered up. Uh, we, were, we, we have reason to believe that a local cowboy was hired to go out and uh, help pick up materials. And the Army came in with a, a road grader they borrowed from the Catron County and leveled the site out. That's why it was so clean. Uh, I have some pictures here. Of, of, but if you, uh, you, get, you got my uh, website card, uh, the, the whole thing is on pretty much on a CD, and this book here is pretty much the story. And after after the meeting, come take a look at this. Your, your information may be here. We're dealing with polyethylene uh, on this. Uh, the shoe has seven layers of cotton, and a guy at Nike said, "We can make shoes out of cotton, but we couldn't afford to make a shoe like this and put it on the market. You know, this is for a specialized foot." I didn't tell him I was doing UFO research, <laughs> so. I didn't think he wanted to know it either. <coughs> it's it's no. all cotton. Uh, seven layers of it are cotton. So that means cotton grows somewhere else, you know. Uh, and we found some material that was made from a carnauba palm, uh, which is this wax you use for your car. They use the wax on apples. Um, and and uh, some of the wax, we found some wax pieces. And they're, they're all here in the... Um, uh, in this book. Uh, the old title of this is the, uh, the UFO crash on the plane to San Augustine and I'm coming out this fall with a newer a newer cover and a different title. But you can see the uh, on the website you can see a, a, a small bit of each chapter and what it contains and how to get a hold of the book. It's ordered from the UFO uh, uh, store over in the Baker. Baker. Are they sure that's not a shoe from a we say? Child or a doll. How do they know that's not a shoe from a human being or a doll or a small child? Does the shape of the Well, they they is me, okay. and, and so <laughs> let's get down. Let's get down where the buck where the buck stops right here. Um, I was found this in ninety eight, ninety seven. I've compared it. Yeah, I found this out. I compared it with every known shoe size that there was, and um, it does not fit. Any known foot. It's too long. Now, have you had children, sir? Have you had children? Have you seen children? You've seen children. Uh, how, uh, are their feet thin or, or, or wide? Kind of wide. Wide, yeah, because they're, uh, they're still learning to, uh, learning to walk. And, and the, the, the child's shoe, uh, of this is four and a seven eighth inch long. The child's shoe of a standard child, four and seven eighth inch long, is uh, three quarters of an inch wider than this. On both sides, this and uh, and it has a wear spot in the bottom, like somebody's going up and down a ladder. Uh, our children wear shoes out of wear, ladies. Where our children wear out shoes, they're crawling where they wear them out. 
The toes. So uh, this uh, nowhere on the toe whatsoever. You had some shoe store people look at that too. Oh yeah, I've got shoe store people. I, I had a, 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 a forensic lab in Chicago looked at it to analyze each layer for me. And a foot doctor. Uh, five foot doctors. And um, so it wasn't just him. Yeah, right. It's right here. Whole chapter on it. Did you have DNA Everything I know is in here. Did you have DNA testing done on it? Uh, what testing? Oh, DNA. DNA. No. I've had about 20,000 bucks so far, and uh, I'm not spending much more. <laughs> if you know somebody who would like to have done a DNA test, I did find a very interesting seed in here. I, it, I went out to a motel and put it, washed it in a handkerchief, and we got about three minutes left, so. Uh, uh, and, uh, and out came some seeds. Well, after exhaustive uh, uh, analysis, it turned out to be a tumbleweed seed. So they had a lot of blind alleys. <laughs> yes? Are you familiar with the fact that um, France, as a government, last fall said that they were going to publish the results of the DNA test in the Netherlands? No, I'm not. And uh, I'd like to know more about it. So uh, I'm not on top of a, a lot of things. Uh, yeah. I'm not on top of a lot of things. So. Uh, uh, I only just kind of stay in my area of uh, what I'm working on. And uh, uh, believe me, that keeps me busy. Believe me. Any other questions? We got one more on here? I'll be up here. Yes, I see a hand. Uh, four fingers? Five. Five. All right, I got five fingers now. <laughs> you want to go for six? Okay. Uh, Well, they were for a while. Yeah, they were for a great while until they kind of tightened up again, yeah. Has it closed down? Uh, well, it closed back, uh, I think Putin kind of closed it up a few years, a couple of years ago. But when uh, Yeltsin and some other people were in, they were really going to let it all out. So apparently they've been very interested. And my guess is one of the people that they did not uh, want to know that we were in contact with anything from outer space would be uh, the uh, Russians. Uh, they probably didn't understand where we were with alien technology and so forth and probably till uh, the late 50s. They probably have their own now, their own contacts. But uh, uh, it was kept a very, a very, very hush-hush, that trip that Eisenhower made. And I still have trouble getting information out of people. They, they know I know that, that he's, he was there. The patriot, patriotism uh, runs pretty deep. It might even... Uh, Boiled up a little bit in this show uh, with uh, President Eisenhower. Yes, sir. Hey, Art Stern, I came in late. Any chance you're going to be on coast to coast with uh, revealing this information about Eisenhower? No, I, they won't answer my mail, and I'm not going to try any longer. Okay. I've tried to punt it, tried to Dory, sent uh, emails off to. Uh, uh, I was on it in, uh, by, in 2002 right. with uh, George. Uh, 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 Nori, but uh, I cannot get uh, the UFO community uh, interested in this material. And I'm getting kind of tired of trying. This may be my last, uh, first and last shot at it, I don't know. Do you know why that is? Uh, I'm not sure I want to know, but uh, I, I'd like to, I would like to know. Because I see all people out there with all kinds of crazy things. And uh, here I've got a table full of facts and I can't get anybody to look at them. So, yes. I just have one more question. Yes. Um, on a personal note, after seeing this all emerge over the past 50 plus years, uh, what do you think, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question, what do you personally think is the most important, significant uh, thing, if you will, to come from the emergence of UFOs in people's minds and so forth? Well, I, I can tell you my, my own. Uh, yes, yeah, my own. Um, I would say it has given me a broad enough mind to understand what, what's important in life. And the most important thing is peace of mind. And if you've got that, you've got a treasure. Uh, whatever you study, to try to find something that will give you some, uh, some return. And 
I understand religion better. I understand uh, the past better. I understand my own life better as a result of having kept my, uh, mind, uh, 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 my mind open. Eisenhower, uh, it wasn't Eisenhower, sorry, Einstein said, and I'll close with this remark, that the human mind is like a parachute, and it works better when it's open. Thank you very much.